Hello everyone, my name is Chris Ayers and today we're going to talk about securely deploying infrastructure as code and we're going to leverage Terraform and a bunch of open source tools. Like I said, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm a senior customer engineer at Microsoft. I um, work on the fast track for Azure team, so I'm part of Azure Engineering. Uh, you can you know, follow me or reach out on Twitter or X, Mastodon, LinkedIn. Um, I have a blog where I actually have a blog series about some of this content. Um, and all of my source code, all of my slides, all of my demos, they're all out on GitHub under Code Bytes. So let's go over our agenda for today. Today we're going to talk about what is infrastructure as code, just kind of at a high level, just to refresh things. We're going to go into security tooling, you know, the what we can do with it, what are rules and customizations, how we can integrate it into our workflow, um, and those integration points like pre-commit hooks, VS Code, um, extensions, and then GitHub Actions. So we'll, we'll have a fun time, and I got a few bonus topics at the end if, if we have a, enough time. So what is infrastructure as code? You know, at a high level, it's just a way to manage and provision infrastructure resources um, using configuration files and automation tools. And, you know, I, I, I work on Azure, so I have resource groups drawn here. One of the goals of this, I think, one of the best ways is to make it easier to deploy and manage our infrastructure. We make it repeatable. So we can define some infrastructure. We can stamp it out multiple times, like into different resource groups through environments like DevQA prod. We can, you know, reduce the risk of our errors that we might do by manually going out to a portal or manually running commands where we, we could mistype something. Um, you know, we can have it in code. And one of the things I usually bump into when I'm trying to define and create infrastructure and solutions is security and compliance. Um, many industries have regulations that are needed um, that you have to follow for, for compliance because there's been a lot of breaches. There's been many attacks and, and um, data leaks because in some cases of just misconfiguration. Um, maybe we just forgot a property like requiring HTTPS. Um, we already are building cloud solutions. We're, we're building out architectures. We're writing infrastructure as code. We also have to be security experts to a degree and we can leverage tooling to help relieve us of some of that um, Burden. I mean, looking at the OWASP top 10, we're running into tons of stuff where um, you're getting both security misconfigurations, um, you know, is like the fifth most highest thing in 2021. Um, but you're also seeing in containerized environments like Kubernetes, you're seeing some misconfiguration uh, of, of workloads, of policies, uh, logging and monitoring. All of these things can be defined in some way by infrastructure as code. And we can leverage our tools to help take over some of that. You know, and we see it again and again, looking at the state of uh, cloud security report, um, logging, encryption, access policies, identity management, firewall rules. All these things are very easy to make a mistake on and to open a door for an attacker to get in either disrupt the application or take data from the application. Um, I've worked at a lot of places where we might have, you know, five, 10 years ago, done a security review towards the end of our project and then tried to fix all the issues. But you can't do that. You can't just try to fix things when they're in production. Many cases you'll run into problems that if you'd caught it earlier, it would have been a quicker solve, uh, cost a lot less, and so nowadays we really need to think about shifting left on security, having these things from our, you know, ideation, like from the very beginning, is the architecture secure, are these resources in a secure configuration, even before we start talking about data and applications. Now there's a lot of tooling we can use, um, just like as a developer, you know, I, I, I do a lot of coding and a lot of languages. I'm used to having things like linters and security scanners. Um, and so I usually like to run these because I want to catch these issues early. I don't want to put, you know, bad code or bad configuration out there in an environment. I want to catch it 
um, on my machine if I can before I even check it in or in a pipeline before I even try to deploy it. I want to make sure that everything I'm doing is compliant. Again, if we're in one of the, those industries that have a lot of regulation, um, you know, like fintech or healthcare, we want to make sure we're compliant so we're not causing an issue. Um, we have uh, solutions out there today in a lot of cases. Not everything is greenfield. You can run these tools one time or multiple times on your current applications. And you know it's using industry best practices. It's using knowledge gained from multiple companies and, and multiple engineers at different levels. Um, they might have some recommendations that you're not aware of, especially if security is not your full-time job. And it can help improve the security of your existing infrastructure and your existing solutions. And that's going to save a lot of time. You know, like I said, we're going to catch these things on your machine in, in the repo, in the pipeline, um, before we even get out to the cloud. So all of these, I think, are wins. Now, you know, I'm used to running scanners against my code. There's usually two types. There's SAST, Static Application Security Testing. And there's DAST, which is dynamic application security testing. Usually the difference is SAST just runs on your source code. It has modules usually to understand your language, and it has rules that it looks for to see if there's a misconfiguration, uh, if there's something that's a vulnerability, if there's a problem. Um, if you're worked with developers, check marks or sonar cube, sonar source, that, that could be something that you've heard of or used something like that before, like a trivi. Um, on the dynamic side, this is where we actually build the infrastructure, build the application, deploy it, and we're running scans against the real application, like, like Zap or the OWASP toolkit, where we're looking for some of those things at runtime. Um, now, today, we're really going to focus on SAS tooling. And the SAS tooling for Terraform has a few things that are a little specific to Terraform, a little specific to, to um, the problem at hand. So they can understand usually and scan HCL files. So your, your Terraform modules, all of the .tf files that you're writing in HCL, a lot of these SAS tools can scan that and understand that, no problem. But they can also look at your Terraform plan. So you can run a, a, a plan and then analyze that to see if after all the variables have been plugged in and substituted and all the properties and loops have been um, generated, you can check to see if there's a misconfiguration at that point. So some of the dynamic stuff you're doing in your HCL files might not get picked up, but you can run it against your plan and, and pick up some of those things. Now, we're going to look at three different types of tooling today. Um, there, are, there are a couple other bonus ones. I'll mention some things, but TFSEC, TerraScan, and Checkoff. Now, these integrate into your CI CD pipeline. All of them do. They all have rules, and, and I'll dive into that a little bit more. They support custom rules, which I'll explain in just a moment. And um, a lot of the rules for TFSEC and TerraScan, uh, most of the ones provided are written in Rego, which is used by uh, Open Policy Agent, where we're doing policy as code. Um, it's a simple syntax. I'll, I'll cover it briefly. Um, but TFSEC also supports some JSON and YAML logic. And then check off uh, most of them are written in Python. So I mentioned that custom rules, rules customization. Now we can do a couple things with that. We can ignore rules. So if we're getting a lot of noise and we're just trying to focus on certain problems, we can ignore things. Uh, in most cases, it's a comment that you add. And you can even say ignore until a certain date. So if you have to like if you get a delay and then you have to focus on um, that issue, you know, you can tell it to remind you again on a certain date and start feeling the pipeline if it hasn't been resolved. Um, you can override rules. So if something is listed as a low priority and you want it to be a high priority or critical, you can change the prioritization of rules. Um, so if something maybe is really high and you think it should be low, you can do that or the other way around you have complete control over this and pretty much every tool that I've that I'm going to be mentioning. And finally, you can write and add your own custom rules. And I'll, I'll show you this as well. Um, there's a couple of options. So let's look at the tools. I'm going to start with TFSEC. So TFSEC is 
one of those SaaS tools, and it's by Aqua Security. Um, Aqua Security has a number of tools in their, their suite of products. Um, this runs great locally. This runs really well in your CICD platform. Like I mentioned, it does use OPA and Rego policies, but this has a VS Code extension, which is nice. So while you're working in VS Code, it can analyze that. And it does have a GitHub action out there. Now, something I want to mention, um, in February, it was announced that Trivi is going to be merging a lot of the logic and things of TSSEC into Trivi. So Trivi is kind of their one-stop shop for everything from you know Docker to configuration to VM images. TFSEC is very much just focused on Terraform. So if you're only doing Terraform, TFSEC will do everything you need to do. If you're looking at multiple languages and stuff, Trivi you know, might be able to uh, cover your needs as well. And they use a lot of the same syntax and reporting. I have some demos of this, so I will dive in and show you TFSEC. But as you can see here, um, it's giving you the lines of Terraform that are misconfigured. It's giving you an ID around it, links to documentation on how to resolve it. So I'll show you this and we'll, we'll dive into that. There's also TerraScan. Uh, TerraScan, kind of like Trivi, um, supports a lot of stuff. Like this is not only going to scan your Terraform, it'll do ARM and, and BICEP modules. It'll do GCP and AWS. It'll look at like Helm charts and, and um, customize Docker. It'll even tell you if like some of your GitHub stuff is a little off. This is um, this is supported by Tenable. So um, Trivi and TFSEC were Aqua Security. TerraScan is Tenable. Um, they are merging this into their Nessus you know, premium product as well. Um, both of these have hundreds of, of rules on configuring resources from pretty much all the different providers, uh, major cloud providers that are out there um, with Terraform. And finally, uh, Checkoff. And, and this is actually one of my favorites. Um, this is by Bridge Crew. Uh, that it was recently called by Prisma Cloud. So um, I will show you how that documentation and how that integration works. They have an amazing VS Code extension, which I'll show you. Um, this like the others, pretty much supports a little bit of everything. Terraform, ARM, Bicep, CloudFormation, Kubernetes, Docker. Um, all of these are pretty awesome. Um, I And I'm going to show you all of them. Um, and just as a bonus, kind of some nice things that, that help you with your security. Um, your, your is a really nice tool that works with your Terraform to help automate tagging. So you can, uh, I've got an image here on the screen. Um, so you can automate your tagging around like what the or the Git org it came from and repo and what commit number and the last time you modified a resource. So we can tag all of those things just based on things in your Git repo. It's, it's really nice and it integrates in CI/CD. The other one I want to mention is Atlantis. Um, you do have to run this on a compute somewhere. So like a VM or a cluster outside of your normal like GitHub Actions or, or, or DevOps or whatever that might be, but it'll monitor your Git repo and it'll automatically run a, a plan when you open a PR and it'll lock um, the resources essentially. So you can only do one plan at a time. And so you, it will help you prevent having two or three people merging PRs around the same time or doing PRs around the same time and having plans kind of step on each other and having a couple of issues there. And so th this is a really nice tool um, that integrates well with your, your workflow. Now, I'm talking about multiple tools because you can do defense in depth. Like these are independent tools. They can scan the HCL or you know, the plan, the interpreted HCL. In some cases, you're gonna get different rules. You're gonna get different alerts. Um, you could have better compliance. You could also just have a lot of stuff going on. So. It, uh, all of these are, are valid options. Um, now, how I integrate these into my workflow, there's three ways, usually. Pre-commit hooks. So on my local machine, I can do pre-commit hooks, um, which are awesome. Uh, IDE integrations, so VS Code extensions, Visual Studio extensions, other tools that, that integrate it into your workflow so you're getting alerts while you're writing your Terraform. And then in the pipeline, CI, CD. So GitHub Actions, GitLab, um, Azure DevOps, 
whatever that might be, there's also a lot of integrations in the pipeline that you can do. So I mentioned pre-commit hooks. If you're not used to them, if you haven't used them before, when you're working in Git, um, when you start committing something, there's a pre-commit hook that runs before anything happens, like before it creates the commit object or asks you for a message or saves it to the file system. Now this framework is pretty cool. Uh, it's out there at pre-commit.com and you can come out here, uh, it uses Python, and you can you know, install it, run pre-commit, and it has this config file where you can say, hey, I want to check YAMLs, I wanna make sure there's no spaces at the end of line or, or um, white spaces, and they have pre-commit hooks for uh, checkoff, TFSEC, and Terrascan. So I'll show you those, but this actually stops you from checking in insecure code on your machine before commit, which is pretty cool. Like it never even gets to the repo, never even runs a pipeline. The second way is the IDE integration, where you know we want to have alerts about problems while we're editing. We want the red squiggles. We want to be able to mouse over things and get alert messages. So there's two good extensions for VS Code, TFSec and Checkoff. Um, there's also one for Trivi. Um, Terrascan doesn't really have an integration in VS Code. I, I found um, they have one for their policy editor to like to help make policies, custom policies, but I didn't see one for alerting you on problems. So that that's kind of a miss there. Um, and I'm a big fan of dev containers, like make a dev container to have all your tools you need to write stuff. And there were a couple missing dev container features. I submitted PRs to create them. So we have there is an extension or a, a dev container feature for TR TFSec, Trivi, Terrascan, and Checkoff. So all of them have dev container features, so you can just run it on the CLI inside your dev container. And then pipelines. So in GitHub and pretty much similarly in DevOps, you, there's a TFSec action, Trivi, Terrascan, and Checkoff. So you can run these things in your pipeline, and I'll, I'll show you those uh, in a moment. So let's get to the demos. All right, so here is my um, repo, uh, Secure Terraform Manager. I've opened it in VS Code and I've opened it inside a dev container. So I've got a dev container here with all the all the features, all the stuff that you can play with and all the extensions. Um, so as an example, you know, if I just open a Terraform file, you can see I've got some red squiggles down here. And it's giving me some information about these. You know, I've got a folder here with custom checks that um, some of them are failing, some are passing, and, and we're getting some different alerts. So I'm gonna start with the TFSec extension. So this is TFSec. Um, you you can just find it in the extensions menu and you can add TFSec. And you can, you know we've got your little refresh thing here to run it against the workspace. Now you can bring up the command palette and look for TFSec. And you can see we've got like refreshing it, running against the workspace, and it'll go get um, the version if you need one. But I ran it and I've got a medium here and I can see down here my findings. App service authentication is activated. It does not have any authentication enabled. So looking through this, I can, I can see I've got some stuff, but I don't have an identity. And it says it's a medium severity. Anonymous HTTP request could be accept will be accepted. And so there's a link down here from Aqua Security. So I can click on that and it'll give me a little bit more details, some ex explanation, the insecure example, which is similar to mine, and then a secure example saying, hey, I should do auth settings true. You know, so I could I could take this, come back to my code. Um, I'm probably putting it in the wrong spot. Let me double check. But then I can rerun it and see if that uh, medium error goes away. And it did. So this ran and got rid of that error for me. So now I can look at my next one. So this has web app with AD registration. Now, something we can do is there is a .tfsec folder and I can make a config file. So I can change like given a rule, 
if I want it to be critical instead of a medium. If I want to say, don't show me low, or the last thing to show me is low, let me, you know, don't show me the low, only show me mediums. So I can use this file to have control over what I'm saying. Um, the other thing we can do, and I just deleted it, so I'll bring it back, is we can look at custom rules in, in TFSEC. So we can say, I want a naming pattern for my resource groups. I'm going to give it a description and impact. I'm going to tell it which resources it affects. So this affects Azure resource groups. And I can give it a regex saying, hey, it needs to be named this certain way. Like I want it to be named um, a certain way. Maybe I want tags. I want to have all these things have a tag that says cost center. So now that I've defined some custom rules, I can, I can rerun this. And we have a high. I'm getting a warning on a deprecated app service. So this failed. I'm using app service. So instead, I should use Linux web app or Windows web app. And I, ha I can have a link right here to my documentation. And this is saying, oh, this has been deprecated. Use Linux or Windows. So I can do custom, um, custom information on my, my, my various uh, checks and I can also come down here and I could define if I wanted some sort of Rego alert like hey if it's a key vault and its iteration is retention is less than 14 days alert me that that's a problem now TerraScan and I and I can also run it TFSEC um, like I can just kind of run it on the command line if I want using that uh, yeah so cough center naming and you can see I'm pointing at my HCL so it's not picking up the full plan it's not getting some of the uh, variable substitution um, the next one again I did I don't have a um, extension for this TerraScan now when you run scan what it's going to do is it's going to pull all of the policies it needs from a repo a git repo and it'll run through them and you can see it's checking some of those other languages like um, I saw it's looking in my whole folder under Terraform it's checking every cloud formation templates uh, I was looking for helm and customize but it found ensure logging for key vault is enabled and I can you know go look at that file and I don't have logging enabled so it's warning me that that that's that's a problem um, I don't like this one as much I mean it's good it's great in a CLI um, and a CI/CD, but it it doesn't integrate well with my workflow. Um, also, I can come over here to my Rego policies, and I can define a Rego policy. So I can tell it um, I have to give it a JSON file. So I want to look at key vaults, and it's going to have a Rego file. This one is going to be the thing. So the JSON file has all the metadata, the severity, the descriptions, the categories, the ID, and then the Rego file that it references has all of the queries and stuff. And because these are two different tools, you'll notice the Rego is a little different. Input Azure Key Vault. This one is in, input Azure RM Key Vault. So, so it's a little different, something to be aware of um, in the docs. And finally, just so that we can quickly go into it, um, check off. So, you know, I have, I have a trivi extension it does just like the, the tfsec but i don't have you can see i don't have a checkoff view but if i look in my extensions i did install a checkoff extension what's nice about this one is it just integrates right here into your problems so i can look at my problems and go oh i'm uh, accepting https or http i'm not redirecting it when i mouse over this it actually pops up and gives me some information. I can see the check of Azure 14. I can click on the link and say open. And it's going to take me over to that Prisma Cloud documentation, like I mentioned. And I can see the ID, the, the information about it. I can see a build time fix. So this is going to show me how to resolve my issues in Terraform. And then a lot of cases, what I'll also see, and this one might not, but some of the other ones might, I'll see a runtime fix and it'll show you how to like 
go out into the portal and resolve your issue. So it'll show you both build time and runtime fixes for a lot of these. Um, but I do like there's a good description. Uh, it's telling you exactly which resources are affected and how to resolve it. And it integrates right here into my thing. I can, um, you know, I can see the version down at the bottom. This also has a command completion, so I can install it. I can run my scan. That'll pretty much scan everything and populate uh, the problems area. So I can, you know, go to my documentation. I could, you know, if I'm wanting to try to focus on one type of file. You know, I can just filter it. I can go work on just my HTTP issues. You know, double click takes me to the, the relevant service. So that is a lot of the tooling that's out there that, like I said, big, big fan of. Now, the other way I mentioned that you can work with some of these is going into like, and let me just stash these and check out show you this. This is real nice. So pre-commit. So when you have a pre-commit file and you just type pre-commit, you can see it's pulling in various tools, the tent terror scan, check off, um, and it's installing things that it needs to. These files live in a dot pre-commit YAML, pre-commit config YAML that is at the root of your repo. Now, I mentioned that, you know, I wanted to do some basic stuff, like am I adding large files? Do I have valid YAML? Um, are the, do I have a new line at my end of files? Do I have any trailing white space? Like uh, I just saw I had some in one of these. I want to run TerraScan. I want to run Chekhov. I want to run uh, Terraform Format, Validate, and TFLint. So I want to run all these things. So this says, initialized my environment with pre-commit, I can um, install the hooks. So every time I try to commit, it'll run these. I can also just run it uh, and say on all files. And you'll notice some things. Like right now I have no modified files. You can see it's starting to fail some things. And if I scroll up, uh, it failed trailing white space on a couple of files, including this YAML file. You know, if I look at the bottom, there's now a new line at the bottom. It failed um, some various things like end of line fixes. It's running through, like I said, TerraScan and uh, Chekhov, like all of these are being run. Um, and be, this is kind of a problematic repo. I have a lot of examples, but like I said, looking at, looking at these files, you can see it's like removing white spaces. It's adding new lines. So it's, it's running through the scans for us and letting us kind of automate that before we even check it in. Uh, then I mentioned, like I said, we had the tooling um, in VS Code that was scanning all of our stuff. And then if we go look in GitHub, um, I will show you a couple of workflows real quick just to demonstrate um, all that's there. So we have all these workflows here. Um, we have a TFSEC workflow and that pretty much just does a clone and then it's using the aqua security tfsec action and one thing i'm doing that's a little different is i'm outputting it in junit um, a lot of enterprises use github advanced security it is incredible with what it could do with code ql uh, and you can use um, serif files from all the other tools to kind of upload in the serif so it's getting there on your secu uh, your security page not everyone has advanced security um, so I was using a JUnit format with an amazing public um, community supported extension, uh, published test results. And this publishes uh, JUnit tests. So my tools are all outputting in JUnit and that's being published into my PR. So I have um, TFSEC, we've got TerraScan where you, you can see there's a ton of options here. You can specify different things if you want Serif, if you want uh, various um, folders you want it to focus on and ignore others. And then Chekhov also has a ton of various options and outputs that you can tweak and manipulate. 
and this is um, going to use the container version by default, but you, you can you can tweak all that. So let's see what this looks like up in Azure or, or GitHub. So um, I've got all these actions over here. You can see uh, I've been making various tweaks and we have a pull request. You know, like I was trying to merge in some some bad code. And if I come down here, I can see because of that J unit, um, the various like TFSEC actions like the, the past test and failed tests. Um, it has all the different symbols to show me if, if something is failed or run. And so I can come over here and I can look like, okay, Azure storage is using a TLS, an insecure TLS version. And you know, I, I can go look at the output of it. Um, I can get information about various um, failures. Now you might ask why I care about all this. Well, I mean, I can go out to Terraform um, and, you know, let's say storage account. Something I think that, that most people might not realize is, um, and I know a lot of people learning do this, like I can come here and just get an example storage account and I could, you know, let's just say, make a new folder and you know, paste that in there. Um, you can see checkoff is already scanning down here at the bottom. But what we might see is we have a problem. We're not using, we might not be using the latest version of TLS. This is straight out of the documentation. Uh, we, we, we are allowing public access. We maybe don't have logging turned on. We don't have encryption with keys. And so just using the samples right out of the web page, we might be inadvertently misconfiguring things. So having these run in our pipelines, being able to kind of check this stuff and, and see these results and see that we've had failures um, it is a huge value. I want to switch gears real quick just because it's short on time. Um, back-end providers. So we all know or, or understanding how much information is stored in your Terraform state is super important. If you're doing it locally, it has all of the keys and secrets to the kingdom. Um, you want to do it in a secure manner. You don't want to just keep it on a build machine. You want to store it in a back-end like Terraform Enterprise, you know, Terraform Cloud. If you want to use uh, in Azure, you can use an Azure storage account. You, know, you can use an S3 bucket. There's lots of different providers. Um, that there's documentation on it both on Terraform and for us at like um, Terraform on Azure documentation. But you should override your backend configuration. A lot of times what I do is I have an empty backend block that's checked into the code. That way I'm not checking in my backend information so that someone would know where to go look. And in my CICD pipeline, I override that with environment variables. So just to show you that real quick, what that looks like, um, you know, this might be a configuration. And you, there are people that will check it in and have the name of the storage account and the name of the resource group and the name of the container where all that information is. Or um, you can have that checked in and say, I want to use managed identity uh, to log in or OIDC. What I usually do, and I'll show you exactly what it looks like, is... this I've got kind of a empty back end say I'm using Azure but I don't really give it a configuration that configuration is not defined here what I'm doing is I'm actually passing those and I'll show you in the workflow I'm getting some I'm getting some environment variables that are secrets out of github action secrets and I'm getting the state out of my secrets through an environment so I'm using environment and secrets to um, log into Azure. And this is just making sure that these resources exist. But, you know, I check out the code and then I do an init and I override the backend config. The storage account name is this, the container name is that. Um, and I'm not even passing those other secrets, th these other secrets. Those all come from that documentation. 
So if we're looking at this documentation, it will tell you, you know, down here, uh, a little bit farther, configuration values. It'll tell you, you can be sourced from environment variables. And they tell you, like, what some of the values are. Like, I can use host names and snapshots. I can use endpoints and subscription ID. So this is the same for most backend providers. You can come in here, you can see the environment variables, and you can pass them in your pipelines. And then you can override stuff if you need to with dash backend config and the name of the value you want to override. Um, and then you can just format and plan and apply normally. Um, this I think is huge. Um, just making sure it's not checked in and it's controlled by the pipeline. And the only other data thing I really want to cover real quick um, is OIDC. You shouldn't really log in with passwords anymore if we can help it. If you've created a servants principle just to, to deploy, um, GitHub and a, most clouds support some sort of OIDC authentication, OpenID Connect, where Azure, AWS, you know, GCP all trust GitHub or trust some sort of thing. And when the, the runner, like GitHub Actions runner or DevOps runner tries to run, it'll go out and say, please trust me, I'm coming from GitHub. You know, I have this web token, uh, do I have access? So let me just like quickly show you that. So if I were to come and make an application on Azure, if I was to just kind of go to my, um, for Azure, go to Azure AD and go to app registrations and create one, these are, you know, that's where I would end up. I would have, I have an app registration. And a lot of times if I do like a service principle, I might have a certificate or secrets, but with OIDC, it's federated credentials. And, and what's awesome about this is you can say, hey, I'm a GitHub action deploying out. I'm coming from an org. I'm coming from this repo. And then only the prod branch. If the dev branch, if the Chris's branch tries to deploy to Azure, I want it to say dev. It has to be the dev branch or it has to be the prod branch. So I can limit it entirely by the environment in GitHub that's coming. I can limit it entirely by the branch that's trying to deploy to Azure. Um, so this is how that repo, that um, that environment, that branch, if it's a pull request, if that tag identifies itself to Azure. And then I can say, well, this dev one only has access to my dev resources. I have a different identity somewhere else that is my prod one, and it has access to only the prod resources. So you can have really, really fine control over what has access to your cloud based upon your GitHub environment, your, your branch, your stuff. And so you can securely deploy out to a cloud, um, kind of isolating it to only the identities you care about. And with that, I want to say thank you for your time. I really appreciate it.